you would join with me in a word of prayer. We'll ask God to bless our time together tonight. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we are so hungry and thirsty and desperate for you. Lord, thank you for tonight, for this time that we have together. Lord, we want for you at the end of our time together tonight to be pleased by our time together tonight. So Lord, we want to bless you. We want to glorify you. We want to give you all the glory to your holy name. So thank you, Lord, in advance for what you're going to do, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Welcome. Glad you're here tonight. Those of you online, uh, we are, of course, live streaming this, and then it will be archived for those of you in a time zone. It's like 3 a.m. If you're up, go to bed. <laughs> you can still watch this. <laughs> Actually, if you're up, that's amazing. Um, so we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. As I had mentioned, we do have the prayer lists right here. You might want to avail yourself of them now at this time. Uh, these are people that have asked us to pray, uh, people literally from all over the world. And uh, some of the prayer requests on our prayer list are very intense. And so we would most certainly appreciate it if you would uh, in your own prayer time, pray for those that are asking for prayer. But tonight I need to, <laughs> uh, I don't want to say I want to, because I really don't want to, but I need to talk with you about the manifestation of a demonic spirit during the March 24th Prophecy Update live stream. There have been many questions about what happened and a lot of questions about why we did what we did. And that's what I want to start out with. But then we're going to go to the scriptures that directly speak to the reality of demonic activity for which most Christians are sadly and woefully naive. And this woeful naivete comes in two extremes. The first of which is sensationalism. This is the seeing of a demon in everything and everyone. It's a, it's a hypersensationalism. And then you've got the opposite extreme, conversely, which is what I'm going to refer to as cessationism in the context of ceasing, meaning that it's the polar opposite in dismissing of the demonic in anything. So you've got, and Satan loves the extremes, Satan lives in the extremes. So what I'm hoping to accomplish tonight is to offer a biblically balanced response to a deeply divisive issue. Now, before we jump in, I want to refer you to Pastor Mack's two-part teaching titled Demonology. Uh, he did this back in January of 2021, and we'll have the links to those two teachings on the website downloadable PDF file, which also will have the uh, transcripts available as well. Uh, Pastor Mac does an outstanding job of explaining the demonic realm from Scripture. Uh, it's, it's quite a broad uh, topic, and uh, I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm going to sort of paint the canvas with a broad brush, if you will. And what I'm going to share is in no way exhaustive, meaning it's not, there's no way you can cover this exhaustively. So it's not going to be exhaustive. It might be exhausting, <laughs> but it won't be exhaustive in that sense. So let's start with an explanation of what actually happened. Towards the end of the prophecy update, I was 
emphatically stating, and I'm going to quote from the transcript, people are asking questions about the very things we should know and have the answer to, and need to be at the ready to give to everyone an answer of that blessed hope that we have, that Jesus is coming to rapture us before the seven year tribulation. At the exact moment that I said, quote, we are on the eve of a woman I had noticed sitting right in front who had prior already thrown her head back, suddenly stiffened up and screamed out with a demonic blood curdling voice. Our security team ran to the front as she continued screaming at an extremely loud and chilling volume. At first I, <laughs> I thought it was a heckler calling me a liar, stand in line. Uh, sorry. But then the Holy Spirit just quickened me and prompted me, and I realized and discerned that actually this was a demonic manifestation. So I immediately left the pulpit and ran to her. I then proceeded to yell at the demon or demons, commanding them to come out of her in the name of Jesus. And I repeated this while the demonic voice, not her voice, the demonic voice was still screaming. So I kept praying and even had to continue to raise my voice even louder, commanding the demons, come out in the name of Jesus. Finally, after about a minute, which seemed like forever, <laughs> the screaming stopped. And I, along with some of the other brothers and sisters, just kept praying. Then shy of about two minutes into this manifestation, and after she had stopped screaming, she then slumped over and collapsed to the floor. It seemed that at this point the demon or demons had come out of her, and she started to cry in her normal voice while she was lying on the floor and saying she was sorry as she continued to sob. I then began to tell her she was now free as I prayed in my prayer language with the hope that she would be filled with the Holy Spirit, so seven more evil spirits would not come back in, as Jesus taught. I then requested that she be assisted out of the sanctuary and be attended to, learning later that she left peacefully of her own volition. The whole episode lasted for about four minutes from the time she started screaming to the time that I regained my composure and return to the pulpit, where I would eventually end with the gospel, the ABCs of salvation, and the uh, but God testimony. <laughs> Before she left, I, I just sensed that I, I wanted to know her name, because I wanted to keep praying for her. And much to my surprise, she responded in her normal voice, saying, you know me, I'm Tracy, and I worked with Kelly. And she said this to me as she was being attended to and was about to walk out of the sanctuary. Well, as it turns out, this was indeed the Tracy that reached out to my wife, Kelly, about three years ago, wanting to know more about the Lord, and so we had been praying for her, sharing the Lord with her. And I had spent quite a bit of time talking to her. However, it appears that 
she became disgruntled, even angry. And hang on to that for just a moment. She was angry with me for not replying to her last email, which I didn't. It was over a year ago. It was last year, 2023. And you know, I literally get over a thousand emails a day, and I just cannot return emails. And so last Tuesday, I did reply to that email. And I just asked her how she was doing, but I still have not heard back from her as of today. Um, as I've had time to process this and inquire of the Lord concerning this, I have come to the conclusion that this was a textbook case of demonic manifestation vis-a-vis -vis demonic possession. And what's sad is the demon or demons were indeed cast out, but I'm not sensing that the Holy Spirit has come in or upon her, which is why we're still praying for her and would also covet your prayers for her as well. To the question of why it was edited out of the final video, I mean, we've been, uh, I mean, I want to say asked about it, but that's really not, not the case. I mean, there were those that were genuinely asking about it, but it was really more like they were accusing us of trying to hide something. And we were accused of everything from, well, I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to even lend a creed. Um, I want to address this. Uh, why did we edit it out? First, we didn't want it to be a spectacle, especially absent any balanced commentary. And by that I mean, a video like this, without an explanation to go along with this, would only serve to further Satan's endgame. That was his sole goal, namely that of distracting, dividing, confusing, interrupting. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's an evil spirit. The Holy Spirit will never interrupt himself. So I want to also address those who were actually traumatized by this, that were here to witness this and saw this firsthand. I have inquired of the Lord about it, because it was pretty chilling. I mean, it was dramatic, of course, demonic. But what the enemy means for evil, he meant this for evil, but God allowed it for, and meant it for good, for the salvation of many. What's coming out of this as a result of this is that many people are either rededicating their life to Christ, or committing their life to Christ. And let me explain, and this is, I love it when God does that. You have to understand, when I, when I came to Christ 42 plus years ago, I was five, so don't do the math. But uh, I came to Christ because I realized that the devil was real. I came to a knowledge that Satan was real, and I concluded that if Satan was real, then Jesus had to really be real. And I came to Christ, because I was very, ah, I hate to say it, I was in a sense demonically possessed through satanic music. That was the medium that Satan had possessed me. That was the gateway by which I allowed the demonic entrance into my soul. Uh, then when I gave my life to Christ, I just prayed a very simple childlike prayer and told God 
that I didn't want to go to hell because ACDC told me I was on the highway to hell. And that Led Zeppelin's stairway to heaven is not a stairway to heaven, it's a stairway to hell. And I, I just basically, my prayer was, I don't want to go to hell. And I was very intoxicated and not proud of this, very high at the time. And I fell asleep just praying that, that I, it, because I literally, and you'll forgive me for the way I'm saying this, I, I literally had this hell scared out of me and the heaven scared into me. And that was a good thing. And then I woke up that next morning and I knew I was a new creation in Christ. And old things had passed away and all things had become new. And I knew it. And the Holy Spirit was in me and the evil spirits were gone. And that house was cleaned up and the Holy Spirit was now indwelling me. So this is very real. And if this is what it takes, then so be it. So I believe God allowed it to happen so that He could use it for good, for us to witness firsthand the power of the Holy Spirit over an evil spirit, because greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. And we are more than conquerors. And make no mistake about it, the devil is way more afraid of us than we should ever be of him. We have power over him. He is a defeated foe. We should never fear him. He is terrified of us. He is so afraid of us, because he knows he's a defeated foe. He does not want us to know that we, it's a, been a rough week. <laughs> you get the point. He doesn't want us to know that he's a defeated foe. There, that's as good as it's going to get. I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. So God allowed it and now is bringing good from it. And another reason we didn't want to include that video, well, of course, because we know her, my wife and I have been praying for her, and we didn't want to embarrass her. And we're still hoping, love hopes all things, that there will be a but God testimony that comes out of this. And there's no question that God, as only He can, can do that. So we're praying to that end. But it's because of this that we discern there's much more to this, which is why I'm devoting our time together tonight to talk about this instead of our usual prayer meeting. So, I mean, this rises to the level of importance that it needs to be addressed. As of late, I've been discerning and by extension inquiring of the Lord concerning what seems to be an unprecedented increase of demonic activity. And certainly it's a prophetic sign of this, the last days. However, it's also horrifying in terms of being a deception. And it causes division and confusion. It's a textbook case of divide and conquer right out of Satan's playbook. But as for me and my church, we're not playing this evil game. We're fighting the good fight. I want to point something out before we go any further. You know, in Matthew 24, we talk about it a lot in the prophecy updates when Jesus is asked about what will be the sign of your return, the end of the age. And, and Jesus responds first and foremost with the number one sign of deception. But the way He says it is very interesting. And I want you to think this through with me. He says, let no man deceive you. The implication being is that we have this potential, this proclivity, this propensity 
to let ourselves be deceived. We let them deceive us. He's the deceiver, the great deceiver. He's the author of confusion. And this is again right out of his playbook. He wants to confuse. It's very confusing. Wait, this, is this a Christian? I thought Christians couldn't be demon possessed. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, wait a minute. Wait. I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> never mind, I'm not going to go that far with it. Right? Okay. Um, there's, there's something else I have to talk about, and that's that I've been a little taken back by the viral posts on social media and even the requests for interviews from Christian media. I mean, that, that kind of surprised me. I have to confess that. I always decline them, because I know all it's going to do is just feed the confusion, the division. It's not going to answer any questions. It's going to create more questions than it's going to answer. And the other reason is, is that and for those of you who know me, I, I, I want out of that spotlight. I, I go to great lengths to <laughs> stay out of the, you know, spotlight and under the radar. And back in 2019, I, I just made a decision that I was going to decline any and all invitations to speak or do podcasts or interviews or speak at conferences or go on somebody's, you know, YouTube broadcast or whatever. I just, that's not me. That's, that, I'm not saying, you know, that's wrong for them. It's just wrong for me. I just, that's not who I am. I, I've never written a book. It's not wrong. If you write a book, if God's calling you to write a book, you better write a book. But I, I've never written a book. I have no intentions of ever writing a book. I got a great book. In fact, it's a super book. There's 66 books in the What am I going to add to that? <laughs> so I always decline them because, you know what, it, it, it appeals to the, the carnality of Christians, because there's this innate need within all of us for the salacious sensationalism. That's all that is. But in all fairness, there are those who do understand and discern the times, and were just as grieved as we were by all of this. I want to share with you a post on our YouTube channel that, to me, sums it up perfectly. It comes from at Gracie 57, who posted, It deeply grieves me that the manifestation of evil in this service has gone viral, and that believers that missed it are looking everywhere to see it. Thank you, Pastor JD, for being wise. The nature of the incident was handled very professionally and in love for the individual involved. I respect that you did not allow the enemy to be entertaining, the center of attention, and sensational. After the incident, you returned to the pulpit, composed, and continued with your teaching, a sign to me that Jesus had your back. <laughs> Boy, does he. And the Holy Spirit won the battle. Much love to you and your family and congregation. Shortly after she posted this, a reply was posted from at Lorraine Pasicola, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, 771, who wrote, love this comment. Thank you for saying everything that I and many more who feel the same wanted to also say. God bless you and God bless his humble servant, Pastor J.D. Farag and all of Calvary Kaneohe and the woman involved. It's comments like this that are very encouraging. There are many like them. As a pastor, they give me hope, <laughs> especially when it comes to this 
tough topic that we're tackling tonight in the realm of the demonic. There are spiritually discerning Christians, though few in number, that know a Christian who is truly born again of the Spirit of God absolutely cannot be demon possessed. It is impossible. If you are born again of the Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit indwells you, you cannot be possessed by a demonic spirit. That is not biblical. That is not possible. But the problem is you have these false teachings from what are known as deliverance ministries, that are supposedly, allegedly casting demons out of Christians. The spirit of gluttony. Oh, <laughs> uh oh. I mean, you know, th th there's a demon in, in everything, a spirit of this, a spirit of that, a spirit of this, and they're casting them out. How confusing is that? I mean, here's a born again Christian going, wait a minute, I got a demon in me? Get it out. You know what they actually do? And, and be a Berean, by the way, and you search the Scriptures yourself and see if what, if what I'm saying is true. They're creating the very thing that they're allegedly trying to resolve. Instead of casting a demon out of a born again Christian that doesn't exist, they're actually opening up that Christian to the demonic influence. Here's how I get there. A born again Christian can be demon oppressed to the degree in which it will seemingly manifest as being demonically possessed. In other words, if you open yourself up to that, you're still born again. The Holy Spirit does not leave you or ever forsake you. The Holy Spirit indwells you, seals you for that day of redemption. You're saved. You're, you're born again. You cannot be unborn again. And please stop it with the once saved, always saved is a false doctrine. If, if it were a false doctrine, then God forbid you would have to rip large portions of your Bible out of your Bible. Don't do that. <laughs> because replete throughout Scripture, it is very clear in no uncertain terms. Romans 8 is a good example, by the way. There is nothing that can separate you, disenfranchise you from the love that God has for you, neither height, nor depth, nor power, nor principality, or powers of darkness, nor anything created. That pretty much covers everything, can ever separate you from the love of God. You're born again, you're in. You're saved. You cannot be unborn again. Those of you that have children or grandchildren, they cannot be unborn. Though sometimes you, <laughs> never mind. I just thought I'd throw that in for levity. So we're going to get more into this in a moment. And I I appreciate your patience with me tonight. I, I want to give the Holy Spirit the elbow room, so to speak. So I'm not going to put any limit on this. Uh, you know, if I finish early, I'll have uh, Pastor Leitu come up and close out. Um, if not, I may just take the entirety of the time, uh, if so led, to, to really deal with this, because this is a very serious matter. So I want to talk just briefly about Christians who dabble in deceptive and demonic false teachings 
opening themselves up to the realm of the demonic. What if I told you that Christians can unwittingly accept the invitation to dance with demons and play with demonic possessions? Would you believe me? In the Scriptures there are what are known as familiar spirits. Again, it's a very broad, and I'm not going to go in depth, but what are familiar spirits? These are familiar spirits that Christians can become familiar with, that they invite in. They're Christians, but they basically RSVP to the invitation of these demonic spirits, and unwittingly are influenced unduly and satanically influenced by them. In many cases it's unknown, but what these familiar spirits do is they, they promise power. There's a lot of power, not all power, because again, the Holy Spirit's power is infinitely more powerful than a demonic spirit's power. So when you command in the name of Jesus, they can't, don't be generic, because even the demons believe in God. But when you say the name of Jesus, that, that is very irritating to them. And again, we're going to see this in a moment, but you always use the power and the authority of the name of Jesus. You command the demons. I was not commanding her. I was commanding the demons. In fact, initially I even asked, what are you, what is your name, demon? That's, I got that out of the, the Gospels. It didn't work out very well, because <laughs> the, the demonic scream was so loud. And I mean, I get loud, as you know. I, I can yell, but man, I could not yell over the this demonic voice. So I, I abandoned that. Listen, you know what? I don't need to know your name, but you need to know the name of Jesus. And then, you know, I have to learn the hard way, I guess, sometimes. I <laughs> think about the disciples that couldn't cast that demon out of that uh, son. The father brings his son to them. And he could, and then the, the, finally the dad goes, you know what, forget you guys. And he takes his son to Jesus. Jesus is like, okay, out. And then he, out. And then the disciples are going, wow, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus basically says, well, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. But I just think about the, the disciples going, wow, this always worked before. <laughs> why not this time? So anyway, that was my story, and I'm sticking with it. But um, so let's get back to this notion that Christians can unwittingly invite these demonic spirits, these familiar spirits. Now, when this happens, what's going to ensue are demonic manifestations, not demonic possession, but you're going to have demonic manifestations, and it will manifest, these demons will manifest in ways that are not necessarily recognizable at first. Because you have to understand, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. So if you're truly a born-again Christian, and you're playing around with this stuff, you can expect that there's going to be demonic manifestations in a variety of ways. If you're not a born-again Christian, and you're playing with this stuff, you can expect to be demon-possessed in short order. And even not knowing that you're demon-possessed, 
but you are demonically possessed. You know what I find interesting about what happened during this particular update is that I had just commented about the naivete of some Christian when it com Christians when it comes to what I call demonic predictive programming in movies and music, and particularly some of the entertainment on Netflix and these other streaming on demand platforms. I went back to the transcript and I want to share with you an excerpt from the, that same March 24th update. This was prior to the demonic manifestation. And I'm going to quote from the transcript and you'll see why here in a moment. Wow, do they know something we don't? Listen to this quick quote from the article. I was referring to an article on the heels of Sam Ismael's apocalyptic thriller, Leave the World Behind. We talked about that, by the way, in a prior update, Obama, Leave the World Behind. I haven't watched this, nor will I. I have looked at some material to reference it, but I'll never watch it because of the predictive programming, and never underestimate the power of the predictive programming with visual motion picture. Don't think, oh, I can go watch a horror movie. Be very careful, because they are very powerful. Oh, no, I'm a Christian. Well, I'm sorry, you're a naive Christian. You need to be more discerning than that. This is all predictive programming for the seven-year tribulation, because they know what most Christians should know about leaving the world behind. It's an indictment on us. Well, I was referencing this movie that I've covered in prior emails. It was actually produced by Barack Obama. And it was released on Netflix. Uh, this was not that long ago. A very demonic movie, very predictive in its programming of the brain, because see, Satan knows how the human brain operates. Well, what's even more interesting is the day after, and this is Monday the 25th. So I quoted that, that transcript from that same update before the demon manifested. And then on Monday, we got these interesting comments and emails starting to pour in about this subliminal satanic movie. Here's one of those comments. It's posted by at Visionary Vet, who writes, the weaponized audio tracks in the movie were displayed in waveform in the artwork in the house. I have a video on this. This was posted shortly after by at Jeffrey Davies 7615, quoting, the movie Pastor was talking about was made with three separate soundtracks, not one for dialogue and one for film score. The third is the hidden track in it that is subliminal and ULF, ultra low frequency, that makes the hearer susceptible to their hidden programming. It was discovered by a professional movie editor that made copies for distribution. And then this is a reply from at the knowers. I saw that report, better off to leave that movie behind instead. Pray against the Obama demonic intents. I actually talked to somebody that watched the movie. Of course, I asked them, why? <laughs> and this was their response. I wish I didn't. I, I, I was sitting there thinking, in my spirit, it was, this is a Christian. I was so uneasy and unsettled. Well, that's because of the subliminal satanic messaging that is in this frequency. To see, Satan knows that frequency. And by the way, while I'm at it, and since you've already graciously given me the time, 
right? I'm going to take that time and just share with you that this is music, satanic music. And again, this is how I came to Christ. I, I was so heavily into all of this satanic music, not realizing that my brain was, had all these subliminal messages. You know what subliminal messaging is? They did a study. In fact, they, they used to do this. They probably still do, but even worse now, I'm sure. Uh, evil has waxed worse. But uh, this is in the early days of cinema. They would flash uh, popcorn and soda. You heard about this? You, you don't see it, but the subconscious picks it up. And their concession sales went off the charts. It works. Because see, the, the, way, the, sub, <laughs> the way the subconscious mind works is, and, and Satan knows this. So if I come to you and I say, hi, I'm Satan, and I'm here to destroy your life, you're going to run as far away and as fast as you can from that. But what if he comes in the back door and hypnotizes you with a very melodic sound, using certain chords at certain frequencies and tempos. And now you've been kind of, I'm going to give you an example. I think George Harrison, I, I was corrected on this, uh, one of the Beatles. You remember that song? Um, I, I'm sorry, I have to sing it because you, you <laughs> I'm going to program you, so watch, watch this. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you're like, hey, yeah. Hallelujah. And it's very melodic and hypnotic. And then all of a sudden, Hare Krishna. Wait, what? How'd you do that? Oh, I got you. I got you at Hallelujah. And I sort of hypnotized you and, and programmed you and you, I came in through the back subconscious, knowing that I could not come right out of the chute front, front and center and say, Hare Krishna, get thee behind me, Satan. So let's start with Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hare Krishna. And that, by the way, is one of the most successful and top selling songs of all time. I've talked about this. I might as well mention it. It, it. it, I think, is appropriate in the context of what we're talking about. Led Zeppelin, number one song of all time, to date, Stairway to Heaven, the most satanic song ever recorded. Rolling Stone magazine has, I always get them confused, Robert Plant, Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. I think it was Jimmy Page quoted in Rolling Stone magazine, uh, saying that they, see, they bought Aleister Crowley's mansion in the UK. Who's Aleister Crowley? Oh, he's uh, the Sergeant Pepper that taught the band to play. He's in the album cover of the Lonely Hearts Club band, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely. How weird is that? Who's Sergeant Pepper that taught the band to play? Aleister Crowley a self-professed Satanist, wrote books on how you do everything backwards. You read uh, everything. The Psalm, the 23rd Psalm, you read it backwards, because it goes into the subconscious. Uh, you know, you know, remember that song? I hope I'm not going to put songs in your mind. We're going to have to have some really good worship after this. But <laughs> I did not intend to go this far, but th real quick on this. So you know uh, Hotel California, the Eagles? Oh, what a harmless song. Not so fast. You can check in. I mean, you can check out, but you can never leave. You look at the album cover. If you have this at home, first of all, burn it. But before you burn it, just look at it. Because in that hotel, on the album cover, you'll see a man in one of the windows. It's Aleister Crowley. He was basically the inspiration behind all of these satanic bands that literally sold their soul for rock and roll. So in exchange for fame and fortune, 
they sell their soul to the devil, and he gives them all the fame and fortune they could ever want. But then they become his agents. Because all Satan has ever wanted from the beginning was to be worshipped. So that's his, that's how, it's his worship service, these rock concerts. And these are the worship leaders, like Lucifer was, the worship leader of he in heaven. So the power of music and the way it gets into the mind subconsciously, subliminally. So this was all on Monday the 25th. I mean, I'm still trying to process what happened on Sunday. And then this is Monday, which was the day before the cargo ship hit the Francis Scott Key Bridge on Tuesday the 26th. Now here's what's interesting. The cargo ship that's depicted in Obama's Leave the World Behind lost power due to a planned cyber attack, causing it to crash onto the beach. And it just so happens to be eerily similar to the cargo ship that allegedly lost power, causing it to crash into the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Some have even suggested that one scene in this demonic film, predictive programming, shows what appears to be the same bridge, or at the very least, a very similar bridge. And oh, by the way, it was brought down by explosives, like on 9-11 like Building 7. Nobody wants to talk about that. I showed video. And despite the irrefutable evidence, there were no planes. The, the, the plane cannot go through that tower intact. If a plane hits a bird, it crashes in the nose. And the video, they, they scrubbed them. You can't find them. But thank you, those that archived it and caught it. But it was green screened in, and the nose pops out the other side. And I've got quotes from these news anchors saying, oh, and it's come out the other side. <laughs> come on. <laughs> oh, and then all of a sudden, these videos come out showing the explosive pop, 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 that were planted in those twin towers months before. It was a controlled demolition. But let's talk about Building 7. I have a, I had no intention of doing this, but too late. <laughs> yeah, building 7. Oh, the heat from the fire three blocks away melted that steel, and it, it came down in a free fall fashion. Wait, did a plane hit it? No, there wasn't a plane. It just came down. Oh, but there's a newscast from the BBC. And the anchor, they got, they were off script. They, their timing was 20 minutes too early. So the coverage, their following script was, well, we've just heard reports that Building 7 has also collapsed. And it's in the background, in the live shot. It hasn't collapsed yet. Oops. Pulled it. Never see it again. So this bridge, listen, you can call me crazy. I don't care. All right. But this is too unbelievable not to be true. Should, come on. There's video documenting this. It's irrefutable. The bridge pop, 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 explosive, 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 explosive. Boom. Just like 9-11. All predictive programming. Now, for those who are, because I can read your minds, you're going to dismiss this as just more conspiracy theories. Well, listen, you'll be happy to know that the fact checkers have gone to great lengths to ensure that you have a soft pillow 
to lay your gullible head on. And if that's not enough, there's plenty of sand for you to bury your gullible head in. The only issue is you'll have to find sand that hasn't been impacted by the huge cargo ship that crashed onto the beach in Obama's movie. Okay, wow, Pastor, you're being really cynical. Well, it's a sanctified cynicism. And I know it will be misperceived, misunderstood, but the truth is, it's the truth. And this reality is being dismissed, this demonic component, if I can call it that, is so prevalent and pronounced within Christendom, chiefly among those who profess to be Christians, but in fact are false Christians. They're imposters. They're not Christians. And what makes this so utterly grievous is that the vast majority of professing and all even ad born again Christians are so deceived and have believed the lies from the father of lies. Last Thursday morning, March 28th, so now we're four days after the demonic manifestation, an email comes in at 2.50 a.m. Yes, I'm up at that time. Um, it was in response to the demonic manifestation, and I just want to read it verbatim, because I think it says it all. Quote, I love God. God is in me. I praise God. People like you passing judgment is what gives Christians a bad name. We all have the God particle within us. This is our subconscious. I use divination tools to help me see slash hear. This is not for you to pass me your opinion. I talk to God daily. He gave me a gift. Ask Him about it if you're so concerned. Wow! The, You know, it's sad. This is common. You know what I just read to you? That, that's representative of a large portion of the kind of comments and emails we get from professing Christians who are not Christians. Well, one last thing, just It's going to get worse. <laughs> so have a nice evening. <laughs> if you'll kindly allow me to, I do want to turn a corner and explain from Scripture why what happened happened and will continue to happen and even worsen. So what follows are just some, I mean, <laughs> The Scriptures are numerous and voluminous, but I just want to share with you a select few that I, I really spent some time just kind of searching the Scriptures. And um, there's something I want to point out here that is really interesting concerning the demonic realm. So let's start with Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer. Stop right there. When we pray, Satan gets nervous, because he knows that that is the deciding factor. So you can pretty much plan on all hell breaking loose, literally. Because see, Satan will do everything and stop at nothing to keep you from praying, because he knows that if you pray, he's done. 
it's been rightfully said that prayer is where the battle is won, and ministry is just gathering the spoil. That's the power of prayer. So now watch what happened when they went to prayer. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination. I think it might be the same person that emailed me. I don't know. <laughs> a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us, this is Luke by the Holy Spirit writing, and cried out saying, and listen to this, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. When this demonic manifestation took place, the demon's voice said, every knee shall bow. This demon possessed girl said, basically the truth. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. But she's steeped in divination. And verse 18 says, and this she did for many days. But Paul, I love this, let me have this, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, not her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Oh, I'm so glad it didn't take an hour Sunday morning. Now why do I point this out? Because whenever there's prayer, what you'll find there is the demonic trying to prevent prayer. That's why it is when you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to pray. The phone rings, the kids fight, somebody's at the door, wrong address, <laughs> everything happens. That's demonic. Because Satan doesn't want you to pray. Because he knows when you pray, he got to go bye-bye. He doesn't want to go bye-bye. <laughs> so let's connect those dots. And let's also connect this dot. Ephesians 6. Now this is so well known and often quoted, especially recently. The armor of God. Put on the whole arm, armor up. And everybody knows about Ephesians 6, the armor of God, the belt of truth, which holds everything together, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation to protect the mind, the shield of faith above all to extinguish the fiery arrows. The only offensive is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I don't think I missed any, did I? So everybody talks about the armor of God, and then they stop there. Don't stop there. Let's keep going. Because verse 18, Paul says, praying always. Oh, wait. So prayer? What part of the armor is that? It's not. That's how you put the armor on. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me. Listen very carefully, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul, you're asking for prayer to be bold? You? You're as bold as they come, brother. And you're asking for prayer? You just got done teaching us metaphorically this magnificent analogy of the spiritual armor in the spiritual realm, because we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, with people, but with principalities and powers of darkness and wickedness in high places. He actually ranks in rankings four separate demonic entities. 
That's who we're wrestling with. And wrestle is an important word. It's not we fight or battle. No, we wrestle. That is full on. I tried wrestling in high school. I lasted 42 seconds, I think, and I, I'm tapping out. Are you kidding me? I was exhausted. It took me weeks to recover. I was almost hospitalized. I mean, it takes everything in your body. If, if you've ever wrestled or know about wrestling, you know this. So Paul uses wrestling for a reason. This is full on, man, in the spiritual realm. So I mean, here you are. Oh, look at you. You're so adorable. You've got your armor on. Oh, that breastplate. That's, that's your color. You must be an autumn. So now you've got your armor on. What are you going to do? Well, just stand there and look pretty. No, you're going to pray, man. Because see, where there is prayer, demons are there. And notice the connection. Pray that I'm bold to preach the gospel. I find it very interesting that as soon as I preach boldly with an unflinching fearlessness, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that demon said, that's it. Enough of that and manifested. You know, I uh, hope oh, this doesn't come off wrong, but I've made this commitment, I've renewed this commitment to you over the years. I hope you don't tire of me doing so. But as long as God gives me breath and the privilege that is mine to be behind this pulpit and pastor this amazing church, you will never hear a sermon from this pulpit. And that goes for the assistant pastors as well. You will never hear a sermon from this pulpit that the enemy isn't upset with. Uh, as I've shared before, when we should be very concerned is when the enemy says, well done, good and faithful servant. And he sends you a thank you card and a gift card. And he sends your wife a bouquet of flowers keep up the good work. Too many sermons are preached from pulpits today that don't disturb the powers of darkness in any way. They are unaffected. It's the boldness when the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. That's when the demonic realm manifests. So I get concerned when the enemy leaves me alone. If there's no spiritual warfare, I'm like, God, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> I mean, when the enemy leaves you alone, I pose no formidable threat to the powers of darkness. So he leaves me alone. Don't worry about that guy. He's not, he's not a problem at all. In fact, he's on our side, I think. But that guy, He's a problem. He's causing a lot of problems for us. So we need to ramp it up. And we need to do whatever we can to silence him, them, because they're a threat. Let's go to Acts 8. Therefore those, verse 4, who were scattered went everywhere preaching the Word. Uh-oh, you've done it now. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Well, we've got a problem. Not only is Christ being preached, but people are heeding the message and getting saved and being set free and being healed and heeding with one accord the multitudes. And then verse 7, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many 
who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. What's your point, Pastor? Wherever you have prayer, there will be the demonic. You put in, in addition to prayer, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you've really done it. You've got boldness preaching the gospel, prayer, healing, heeding. The demons are going crazy. And where there is the preaching of God's Word, boldly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and prayer, you can be rest assured the demons will be there. In fact, that's the litmus test to know. They're not going to bother to show up where the gospel isn't preached. Why would they? Where are the demons going to be concentrated? Where are they going to be targeted? They're going to target where the greatest threat is. This is just common military strategy. I mean, Paul in describing, I love how he words it, don't be, you know, uh, ignorant of the wiles of the devil. I love the King James that preaches with the growl, the wiles of the devil, the strategies, the tactics. And it, and it has this idea of the enemy studying strategically the map, like military strategists. You know those old pictures where you got all these guys hunched over the map, you know, they're strategizing militarily, looking for the optimum place to strike. How am I doing, by the way? I can, I'm doing that too good, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got the voice down and everything. It's my voice, though. Uh, so you've got these military strategists peering over and strategizing. Over. Well, that's what Satan does with the map of your Christian life. He's studying you and strategizing, and he's very patient. He's waiting for the optimum time and place and area to attack. And as long as you're not rocking the boat, as it were, no problem. We'll, we'll focus more in this area, on the windward side of Oahu, on Sunday, March 24th. Because that these guys over here, I mean, they're just, you know, they're having potluck and talking about the sandals that Jesus wore. So let's move the battleships over. Is that too much? All right, let's, uh, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. You, you know this well. There's something I want to point out here. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and be turned aside to fables. Hang on to that word. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This word fables, in the original language of the Greek New Testament is the Greek word mythos, where we get our English word myth. Now, when I say myth, a lot of things come to mind, fiction, myth, you know. But it carries with it the idea of a legendary story or account, normally about supernatural beings, the paranormal or events. And in the New Testament, it's always in the context of an unfavorable connotation and manifestation. Fables. They're turning away from the truth, sound doctrine. They won't put up with it. They're going to flock in great numbers to these guys that will tell them what their ears are itching to hear, because they, they, they have a morbid curiosity for the salacious, sensational and so they're going to flock to these mythos. And these are doctrines of demons, as we're going to talk about in a moment. 
It should be noted that this is the same word Peter is inspired to use in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. He says, listen, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables, myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anything that demons can't stand, it's any mention of the return of Jesus Christ in the pre-tribulation rapture. Man, as soon as I said that, she went this way, and Wah! I'm like, what? Was it something I said? Come on, let me have the humor, because I know it's serious, but Goodness gracious. No wonder pastors don't preach on Bible prophecy. Notice the, the, Peter, the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain, speaking of the Mount of Transfiguration. And so, listen, verse 19, we have the prophetic word confirm. Some of your translations re render it the more sure word of Bible prophecy, which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, why do I share this? Because here's the perfect storm. Maybe I can rephrase it this way. Do you, do, you, do you have a pension for a curiosity about demonic manifestations? I'll tell you what the recipe is. It, it's a recipe that was handed down from the generations. This is the, the ingredients that you need for a recipe of demonic manifestation. You need Bible prophecy, the gospel of Jesus Christ, boldness, and the sound doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. That's all you need. You just, I promise you, I guarantee you your money back, 100% <laughs> guarantee. You do that, that's the perfect storm, and that's all you need, and the demons are going to go crazy. And you'll get your demonic manifestation if you want. Just preach the gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ, teach the prophecy confirmed, more sure word of prophecy in Scripture, and teach with boldness. Oh, they, they, you know, the boring guys, the demons are like, yeah, these guys aren't going to, you know, they're just, you know, they're not, they're not, they're, that's not a problem. But that guy's a problem, because that guy actually believes what he's saying. And so, there has to be boldness. Boldness. Paul, you pray for me for boldness. Paul, dude, you've already got boldness. Is there something else we can pray for you for? No. Boldness. Why would he ask for prayer in the spiritual realm? He's talking in the context of the demonic entities in high places. Why in the world would someone like the Apostle Paul, who's Mr. Bold himself, ask for prayer for boldness? Because boldness only comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not manufactured. And it's not something that you can just, it doesn't come easily. It doesn't come naturally. It comes supernaturally. Okay, 1 Timothy 4. I'm going to, we're almost there. But I want to point something out here that 
I, I think it's going to be eye-opening. I know it was for me. The Lord just kind of opened my eyes to this. So 1 Timothy 4, again you know this, verses 1 and 2, the Spirit clearly says that in the later times, the last days, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Now, slide back to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to read verses 26 and 27, and I want you to pay very close attention to this. Paul writing by the Spirit says, In your anger do not sin. Be angry, but sin not. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Why? Verse 27, because you'll give the devil a foothold. Notice the connection between anger and the devil getting his foot in the door. Because see, once he gets a foothold, then he gets a stronghold. What's a stronghold? It's when he has a stronghold. How did we let, again, key word, that happen in our anger? See, demons don't necessarily manifest as dramatically as we witnessed that Sunday. It can be very subtle, again, unrecognizable. I don't know if you've ever connected or made the connection between the devil and anger. Think Cain. Genesis 4, Cain, sin is crouching at your door. He was angry, and he murdered. See, the devil can get in, and he slips in, and he gets his foot in the door of our lives by way of anger and resentment and bitterness. And we're giving these demonic spirits, we're Christians, born again, the Spirit indwelling us, but we're letting the devil get a foothold in our lives. That's the entry point. Now let's go back to Second Timothy, and we'll wrap it up. This is kind of mind-blowing. Just hang in there with me. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 23. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. I like to say stupid that way. Because you know they produce quarrels. Okay, so you're getting angry, and you're starting to argue, and it's getting heated. And the Lord's servant, this is a Christian, they love the Lord, they serve the Lord, they know the Lord, must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, better understood, teach able, teachable, not resentful. Because if that resentment builds and grows and bitterness takes root, and you're angry, and you're just festering and seeding, and you're just angry. You're just writing and signing a blank check to the devil, and he can fill in the amount as much as he wants. Verse 25, those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope, now watch this, that God will grant them repentance leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. Wait, are you telling me that a Christian can be taken captive by the devil, trapped by the devil, used by the devil to do his will? Yes. Pray for them that they come to their senses they don't realize. 
that they've allowed the enemy entry into their lives because of their arguing, anger, quarreling, resentment. You, you, you just said to the devil, come on in. And through anger, a demonic manifestation will manifest itself in this way. Example. You better be careful with that example. Let me get a different one. Okay, I'll use my self. I'll take one for the team again. My marriage. Of course, I have a perfect marriage now. I'm a pastor, right? I told you that. Um, there should be a lightning bolt coming down any minute now. <laughs> so, you know, when there's contention, and we let the sun go down on our anger, the enemy goes to work. You know, if you go to bed angry with your husband, with your wife, you'll wake up in the morning, and the enemy has had all night. And you've given him permission to. You let him in. He, he, got, he got his foot in the door, a foothold. Now he's got a stronghold. And now he's going to wreak havoc. That is a demon that is creating that contention. It's manifesting in, in that way. So I'm hoping you'll take away this very important point, and please don't miss this. Demonic manifestations are not always so overt and recognizable and dramatic and outward. Sometimes they're very, in fact, I would even venture to say more often than not, they're very subtle. And they manifest in ways like this. So let's use the example of a church. You've got division in the church. I assure you, on the authority of God's Word, that is a demonic manifestation in that body of believers that is causing all of the quarreling. Because this is the Lord's servant. Timothy is a pastor of a church. But think of it like this. You think Paul would write to Timothy, inspired by the Spirit, to write this about non-Christians? That doesn't make any sense. Because when would we ever expect someone who has not been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, born again by the Spirit of God, to act like they are? I mean, we expect the world. I mean, that list of 19 characteristics of the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, and treacherous, and murderous. And I mean, that's such a, a, a hard list to read. But it's an apt description of our world today, and getting worse. This is what will mark the last days. So that's written to the church. Because the, why would you write something like that to non-Christians? Because that's, they, they do that. You did that before you came to Christ. But no, this is to Christians. That's what makes it so, I mean, just astonishing, really, if you think about it. So when you get to Second Timothy, the second chapter, and you read Paul writing to Pastor Timothy, that there are people in the church he pastors that have been taken captive by the devil and need to come to their senses, because the devil is using them to do his bidding. What's his bidding? Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Wherever you see division, contention, confusion, striving, the list goes on. I assure you that is a demonic manifestation in a very subtle and unrecognizable way. And be very, very careful when it comes to your anger. Because see, Satan in the demonic realm, it's not Satan himself, he's not omnipresent, but the demons can influence unduly the life of a Christian. And fuel that anger. Because if they can fuel that anger, by the way, this is why it is that 
Christian marriages end up in a divorce. The divorce rate of Christian marriages equals that, if not exceeds that, of non-Christian marriages. You know why Satan hates the Christian marriage so much? is because of what it represents. It's a microcosm of our marriage to Jesus, our bridegroom, as the bride of Christ. It's a microcosm. And, and Satan will target the Christian marriage. And how does he worm his way in through arguments and conflict and strife and contention and resentment and bitterness and anger? And he gets his foot in the door and it's game over. Same thing with the church. Boy, you let this go unchecked. And I want to end on, a, on this note. I'm so thankful for this church. There's very few pastors, and this is not hyperbole, literally very few pastors that could stand before their congregation as I can and say genuinely, thank you because this is so foreign to this God's church. We've not had church splits. And I praise God for that, and I thank you for that. God, in His ferocious protection of this particular church, He's really protected this church. I think what it is, is He looked down at, at your pastor, and He said, wow, this guy needs a lot of help. So he, he needs an extra measure of protection around him, that poor guy, and send him the most amazing people on staff that he could ever hope to have, because he needs all the help he can get. So it was really a pity thing. It's a mercy thing, you know. But God has really protected this precious church over the years. I mean, sometimes unbeknownst to us, we, we, we didn't know what was really going on. And God just removed that individual that could have done so much damage to this, His church. And, it, and at first you're like, wow, you're moving to the mainland? No. And then things start coming out. You're like, no. <laughs> what? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You protected us. That would have been catastrophic. Because these are people, they're Christians, they're brothers. We're going to see them in heaven. They're going up in the rapture, whether they like it or not. They're going up in the rapture. They don't believe in the pre-trip? That's okay. They're going up. Pre-trip. But these are people that have allowed the devil a foothold, an entry into their lives. And he's exploited their anger and unresolved conflict and resentment. And that was the entrance into their lives. And this is the fruit of it. This is what comes as a result of it. And so I just want to leave you with this. Yes, there are going to be demonic manifestations, and they're going to come in a variety of forms. Some are going to be very dramatic, like they were that Sunday, and some are not going to be even recognizable. But let's not be dismissive of the demonic realm. Let's not give it more credit than it deserves, but let's not go to the other extreme and dismiss it as being inconsequential because both are very dangerous. And this is what Satan has been met with a measure of success in doing. He has basically the world believing that he's a red cartoon character with tights on and a pitchfork. And you know, oh, he's so cute. And he pops up on the shoulder, you know. And then you got the other extreme where he's got people deceived who believed that He's the equal and the opposite of God in His power. So they give Him way too much credit, more than He deserves. They don't give Him enough credit 
as much as he deserves, and both are extremely dangerous because they're both extremes. He is a real person, a created being, and I hate to break it to you, but he hates your guts. But Jesus loves your guts. So we're going to end with that. I think that's a good way to end. Capone, why don't you come on up, stand up. I hope that was helpful. I told you it was going to be exhausting. <laughs> Father, thank you. Oh, thank you for protecting us. Thank you, Lord, that we have the power of the Holy Spirit, and that Satan is a defeated foe. Lord, I pray, as the Apostle Paul would ask for prayer, that we too would be bold, fearless, unflinching in our fearlessness in these very evil days in which we are living. I pray, Lord, that we would be aware of the demonic realm, but not afraid of the demonic realm. And Lord, I pray for understanding in, in our own lives personally, that we would not give the devil a foothold into our Christian lives, and that we would recognize the subtle ways that he tries to get in. Lord, I pray for continued protection over this precious body of believers. Thank you for the privilege that is mine to be the pastor of this amazing church. Lord, I pray that you'll keep us safe in the palm of your hands. And Lord, lastly, I want to pray for Tracy. Lord, please keep the demons out and baptize her and fill her with the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you that we can pray that way and have the power to do so. In Jesus' name, Amen.